notional northbound locomotive. In other words, uh, they were a, a massive unit and felt that they were unstoppable, unbeatable. And one of the things that he did uh, to help drive that uh, belief, I guess, and, and also uh, to analyse the way that Carlton were playing in a different way than everybody else at the time, was that he introduced the notion called sacrificial acts. And the sacrificial acts were indeed um, actions on field by players, but which were not necessarily recorded in the normal statistical analysis of a, of a footy game. These were things that were happening generally away from the football, uh, but were uh, plays by Carlton players to ensure that their teammates were then in positions, I guess, to get some of the recordings of the normal statistics, whether that be goals, marks, handballs, whatever it might have been. And so he coined this term sacrificial acts, and then they actually tracked that through games and found when they uh, had not lost a game, they actually committed a certain number of sacrificial acts within that particular game. I think the number was 64, I can't quite recall, but nonetheless, if their players were committed to this notion of looking after their teammates and committed to that through the course of a game and right through the course of a game, it would seem that they could therefore uh, win games uh, almost at will. So again, the notion of uh, those sorts of um, analyses, if you like, or finding those sorts of pieces of data, which can contribute then to building up this thing called, in their case, this northbound locomotive. I, um, through 98, uh, I was asked to go to Middlesex um, because we'd been obviously reasonably successful at, uh, at Queensland. And so Middlesex was a, a town, uh, sorry, a, a county in English uh, county cricket, a, a very successful club, but for the last uh, five years or six years or so, had not experienced uh, any success. They had a, a captain by the name of Mike Gadding, um, and he'd been uh, almost an institution at, uh, at Middlesex and at Lords. And in fact, not only an institution, but he almost had his own place at the dining room, which sat above um, the, uh, the Lords ground. And he would know what was on the menu every day. Um, not only would he know what was on the menu, if he didn't like what was on the menu, he'd actually change it, so it would actually uh, more appeal to his culinary tastes. Mike developed uh, quite a, a girth as season went by, season after season, but at the same stage, he was a person that had a very firm grip on this club. He handed over the captaincy in this particular year to a, a chap by the name of Mark Ramprakash. Uh, and uh, Mark was... Um, uh, in an England team, and there were two other players at Middlesex, a bloke by the name of um, Angus Fraser, another uh, guy by the name of uh, Phil Tufnell. So when I um, uh, arrived at Middlesex, bas basically these three English players are away overseas, they were playing for England in the West Indies. So um, Middlesex, as was the way then, uh, they went for a pre-season camp, mainly because a number of the directors enjoyed going to Portugal and sunning themselves in, while it was still a coolish winter with the notional excuse that, yes, we're having a bit of a team bonding and bringing everybody together and we can plan out the season. Um, so that's what we did. We went to a resort in, in Portugal uh, where they had uh, some uh, sort of areas set aside for us to indulge in some seemingly cricket activities. During that process, it was, um, well, it was a good time because I got to interview and speak with uh, most of the players within the club, apart from, as I said, the three guys that were uh, overseas in the West Indies. And, and part of that um, was an, explore, an exploration for me. How does uh, English cricket work? How does Middlesex cricket work? Because if I'm being brought in here to actually change things around, I need to firstly understand where it's at and therefore what are the, some of the, uh, I guess, immediate wins that we could make. And um, to give you one example, of, of how cricket was, and as I said, this is 98, not too long ago. Um, they would have what they termed capped players and, and uncapped players. So 
So your cap players were those who had, uh, for a period of time, distinguished themselves on the cricket field, either bat, bowl or, or field. And so they were awarded their county cap. And, and with that came a, an increase in pay, uh, sometimes access to a vehicle, uh, if, there, if there were enough vehicles uh, that were sponsored. And when you went on uh, tour, in other words, you, you drove up the M1 to play a few games away from, from home, then you'd generally get your own single room and uh, everybody else that wasn't capped would share. So um, it seemed to me, well, and the flip side of that, I should say, was that the uncapped players, when they went onto the cricket field, they still had a Middlesex cap, but it actually had a Roman numeral two on it. When they went out to dinner, or they were wearing, because we were required to wear jackets everywhere we went, so not only did they have the three sabres on their coat pocket as a cap player would do, but they also had a Roman numeral two there, which was to designate that they were second class citizens. Um, so in terms of a, coming from what we'd been doing in Queensland and this notion of uh, a little bit of egalitarianism and everybody uh, one in, all in, uh, that was part of the discussion. What are some of the things we could change? Well, of course, most of the players who were uncapped and most of the players who were capped were quite happy to release the notion of the, the Roman numeral two. Everybody looked the same. Um, share cars, share rooms. Uh, so that all seemed pretty fine. Uh, we did a few other different things about how we were going to play the game um, and left that resort in, in good shape back to England and welcomed back the players from... Um, the West Indies, the captain and, and, and Fraser and Tufnell. So in a, in a room such as this, uh, we gathered, uh, made sure that for a few hours uh, we broke into uh, table groups. So we placed uh, each of the uh, players that were uh, back from overseas with a table group so that the table group could actually explain all the stuff that we'd talked about uh, in Portugal and then listen to if there was any uh, changes that they would like to make and we would then collapse that into a final um, document that said this is what Middlesex Cricket were all about for 1998. Terrific. We did all that and uh, basically everybody left the room and the club coach came over to me and said, uh, Coach, um, uh, the captain would like to speak to you. And I thought, that's pretty interesting. He must have laryngitis because he was only about three, three metres away. But anyway, uh, come in and um, he wants to have a chat to me. Right, oh, good. So Mark comes over and we hadn't met. This is, the first, this is our first meeting. We had talked on the phone a couple of times. This is our first meeting. And he said, uh, I, I'd just like to tell you uh, two things. Firstly, you don't make any changes in this club. And secondly, none of the other people make any changes in this club. If there are any changes to be made, I will make them. End of story. So basically everything we'd done in Portugal, everything uh, that we talked about in that day, was now seemingly out, out the window. So I thought, all right, fair enough. Um, I, I kind of hear you, uh, but what we'll do is I'll work with you over a period of time to show you the advantages and why we're doing this. Because again, obviously, in whatever we do, and some of the information you've already seen, I guess, through the conference and what you will see, it's so important to understand why you're doing these things. I mean, just, just to change um, uh, some apparel uh, for no real reason would, would seem illogical, or certainly wouldn't necessarily uh, grasp everybody um, uh, for any period of time. So there always has to be a why underneath that. So to me, what I would uh, come back to Mark with because he was desperate to play for England, was the why is that this is going to make your life so much easier. Middlesex will play far better and you will get the accolades for that and therefore that should help you and your cause to stay on the England side. So that was the, the procedure for seven or eight weeks till um, it became quite obvious that, that Mark was never going to, to listen to anything that I had to say. Um, for instance, um, we, would, we, we played one of our first games um, and we had this way that we wanted to play. But Mark went to the, uh, the groundsman and said, I want the flattest wicket you can make. Because he said, I need to be able to make runs uh, because I need to get my selection for the England side. So I'm really not too worried about anything else, just make it a flat wicket so I can make runs. Of course, 
Mark lost the toss, and we were playing Worcester, and two of their bats were made 160 each. So uh, we were chasing about 500 in one of these games, um, after which I found out a little bit more about English cricket at that stage, is that um, you look a long way ahead. You look a long way ahead because the bowlers would bowl uh, decently for a little while and then they realised, well, we've got to get on the motorway and we've got these six or seven games coming up, so we'll taper off our performance here. The fielders did exactly the same thing. It was an interesting lesson in, in the way that county cricket was played in those days. But nonetheless, uh, that tension grew between Mark and myself. Um, couldn't find a way to resolve it to the point where uh, come around about July or so, uh, I was brought before the board and said, well, how are you and Mark going to work together? I said, well, this is what I still believe in. This is what I was brought over to do. Mark doesn't believe in that. Um, so there was only really one choice, and that was to retain the captain and move the coach on. Um, then I was, I was given the opportunity... Um, and look, the part of the reason why I'm going through these stories is I'm hoping that some of this uh, might resonate with you because I, in the end I think I'll get to what I think are probably uh, three points with some little sub-points underneath that, but I'd, I'd, I'll prompt you when we get there to see what you've actually taken from these stories and whether it uh, resonates with yourself and what uh, might work for you. But uh, being appointed coach of Cricket Australia, here was a team that had... Uh, just won a World Cup uh, in 99. Uh, they had a new captain in Steve Waugh um, and, and by all accounts reasonably successful. I, I guess my own particular perspective on that, albeit from outside and looking in from uh, coaching Queensland, uh, was that we did have players coming back into our side that had played for Australia in, in McDermott and uh, Healy uh, Mara had played that by that stage, Hayden, etc. And they were bringing, I guess, uh, information back in to say that you know, things were, were reasonably good in there but could be improved. And I guess going back to what I said at the outset with Queensland, that was a pretty important uh, stage in my life and my career in that it actually made me work out, as I said, how I coached. And part of the way I coach is that I guess with groups, I always believe or want to take them where uh, teams hadn't been before. Let's do something completely different. Let's play the game differently, albeit within the rules of the game, but let's play it differently. So when I got to first meet the Australian team, I didn't really know too many in the room, having coached against them, but hadn't uh, been very close to them. Um, I guess my initial approach was one, you know, this is what I expect of you as a group. Second, uh, this is what I'm bringing to the group. Um, and that would be uh, your value sets and so on and um, try to explain what that looked like. But then what seemed to me to be really important was uh, to create, again, this picture. Now, as I said, they've been reasonably su successful. So this is where, uh, I guess, the concept of Everest came in. I talked about, well, we're, we were all going on a journey to Everest. Didn't know exactly what that looked like or how long. But again, just to, to dive back into, into history, into tradition, which again are little pieces of the puzzle of culture. Um, in Australian cricket history, there was a team in 1948 that had gone to uh, England, uh, been undefeated, came back and were uh, given a label, the Invincibles. So I said our journey, by the time it finishes, should do exactly the same thing. That by the time that we do disband, in that period of time, we should have achieved something very special. Um, hopefully, we will have changed the game a little bit in some way, shape or form. Um, and at some point in time, maybe our period together will also be given some sort of label like the Invincibles. So I guess that was the, uh, uh, the beginning of this journey that we went on and painting that picture. And, and part of, uh, as I said, what I do is one around the team but also around the individual about actually challenging them to be better than what they are or what could they be. You know, there's um, plenty of famous quotes around, uh, I think Paul Anacone used to talk to um, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, 
American uh, Pete Sampras, uh, and also, no, and particularly Roger Federer, also talked to them about it's not what you are, it's what you could be. The quote around Wayne Gretzky, it's around, you know, he never skated for where the puck was, he skated for where it would be. So, I mean, you can take those um, quotes, if you like, and place them in any context you want. But this was, for me, really important for each individual as well. So, no matter how good they are at the moment, what could they be? How could we actually improve that? But it was also um, partly around trying to take them out of the dressing room. Uh, so, in other words, again, you would be uh, very well aware of a lot of your, your swimmers and even, indeed, ourselves as coaches. Uh, you're very comfortable on the pool deck. I'm very comfortable on a, a cricket field or around a, a set of cricket nets. Um, but, of course, uh, as coaches, one of our critical roles, as I said, is not only to extend our uh, players and, and people that we influence, in a technical sense, in, in terms of them being better swimmers or in, in terms of them being better cricketers. But for me, it's also about them being better people. Uh, and so uh, I was always very keen to look at ways and means that we could uh, address this notion of um, extending them as people. So um, one example uh, would be to the first tour I had to New Zealand. I know there's a couple of people in the room that were at a uh, swimming conference that I was at earlier this year and uh, they could probably repeat the story but New Zealand uh, we had a first test match in uh, Dunedin and um, I'd read somewhere there anybody here from New Zealand Dunedin yeah all right so you've been to the Albatross Rookery yep, yep. knows all about it so you can come up and tell the story um, <laughs> but anyway the Albatross uh, the Albatross Rookery you know, these, these birds, incredible, incredible wingspan, a bit like, uh, who was it? Michael Gross. Was, that, was he the butterfly? Uh, the, big, the big albatross or whatever he was. Um, so uh, here was an opportunity to say to the guys, look, th this is almost once in a lifetime. We won't be back in New Zealand for some time. Some of you won't be back here ever again, certainly as cricketers. Um, oh, test matches two or three days away, we finished training, we're going to jump in our buses and go down and see these incredible birds. Wonderful experience. It's a life experience. It's growth of you as a person. Great. So off we go. As I said, this is my first um, trip away with the team. And we had our vans. I drove one. And as a novice coach, I allowed Warney to drive the other one. <laughs> and, and also, poorly positioned, I was driving behind him. So he had the lead. Um, probably about 20 minutes into this long, windy road. It's a, you know, they, they said it's you know, only 20 minutes down the road, but it just keeps going like that. Um, about 20 minutes down the road, Warney stops. So I've got to stop. So here we are, novice coach, um, looking to change the dynamics in the side, um, talking about personal growth and personal development. This is all part of, you know, the, if you like, the the cultural aspect of the team, is it the time that I expressed to Warney uh, that, mate, this is going to be great for you, you know? The notion of you sitting in a car winding around, um, then being able to go and look at these albatross, it's got to be far better for you than going back into your room, texting, uh, maybe having a durry, uh, being on the massage table um, and getting ready for a game of cricket. This is, this is broadening horizons, mate. I thought, possibly not. Uh, so, uh, Warney said, mate, I'm taking the car back. I said, good idea. Um, and I said to the rest of the group, well, uh, Warney's going back, getting ready, you know, for the test match coming up, uh, a bit of recovery and all that sort of stuff. Any, anybody else? Wow. Um, anybody else that wants to go back with Warney, you go in his van, and I'll take all of you down to see the Albatry. Is that how you say plural albatross? Anyway, uh, al the albatrosses. And um, so I drive off by myself. Everybody else goes the other way. <laughs> almost, almost. I did have four or five takers. Um, Steve Waugh being amongst them. Uh, and, and, and again, I, I suppose, um, which is an interesting point, in that, as I said, uh, my picture was Everest and, and uh, changing the game. 
the reason why I guess Steve War and I uh, connected was that that he was always his mantra was about the road less travelled. So uh, you know, a couple of years later, or at least eighteen months later, when we go to India, you know, I was following Stephen then into um, I guess the the armpit, if you like, of of some of the the, uh, the cities that we visited in, in India, some of the real slums and uh, areas that you wouldn't necessarily go to, but for him that was um, you know, a life-changing experience or something that he should experience anyway. Um, so that was always, I guess, my approach to try to um, take players and, and teams where they hadn't been. Interestingly, um, in, without going into you know, one uh, story after another around the cricket uh, team, in 2005, um, we went to England, an Ashes tour, and um, we'd played a lot of cricket up until that point, and we decided we'd have about a six-week uh, six break, and then, and then we'd go to the tour, get ourselves into gear, the, uh, play some one-day cricket, and then get ready for the Ashes series. In hindsight, that was potentially a mistake, uh, because we found that uh, the players, certainly the bowlers, weren't necessarily physically or mentally ready for what was in front of them because England were in a much better place than what we had anticipated. Uh, but also what had happened uh, leading into that tour is that uh, I'd replaced a couple of um, coaches. And, and that was one because my best assistant coach, a chap by the name of ten, Tim Nielsen, uh, had aspirations of being the national coach, uh, which was great. But in my mind, he couldn't stay as an assistant coach if he wanted to um, make, make the top job. So I'd encouraged him to go and find uh, uh, another more challenging, if you like, occupation, a, a, a job that would extend uh, his capabilities. And uh, so I'd lost, I'd lost him. Tim, um, I found, uh, through the course of that tour, uh, was one of those pieces of glue, if you like, that was so important to the dynamics of the team. Because Tim was a real, a real connector. I mean, he was passionate about his cricket, loved talking about cricket. Um, he'd have a smoke and he'd have a beer. And so that meant he'd find his way at different times with different people and just talking about cricket. Yet he was a, an incredible ally. So in terms of that connection, one, he could connect me to other players in his words and, and in his time, and vice versa, he could connect them back to me. Uh, equally, we had changed a, a strength and conditioner, and we'd also uh, seen that some players had taken their partners and families and decided to stay away from the team hotels. So there was complete change of dynamics going on, and I guess one of the things that I found as a head coach was that I, I, in that series, lost my connection to the group. Um, and therefore, in losing my connection to the group and also being in a series that was incredibly tight and competitive, um, I felt um, really at a loss. And so the way that I conducted myself through that series, when I look back, was part of the reason why we ended up losing that. But a lot of things go to making the way that a team operates. And part of that was we had some partner disputes as well, which happened to fall into the mix. We had a player turn up drunk to a, a game for the first time. We had, um, again, as I said, taking people uh, outside of their comfort zone. I'd set up a, um, a sort of a, a dictionary list for our team meetings where players would be given three words um, with explanations and they were to come to those sessions and, and either put them in a sentence, put them in a poem, put them in a lyric, whatever. And we had a lot of pushback from the young blokes. Uh, and so rather than actually taking the pushback but trying to redirect it another way or trying to have some of the other senior players uh, explain why these things go on, uh, that was put to one side as well. So there are, again, a number of those things, little things in them you know, or by themselves, I don't think would have made a huge difference. But 
collectively in a short period of time made a, a huge difference. Um, after I uh, completed or uh, retired from the Australian cricket team, I then, um, with two other coaches, by the name of Greg Shibbert and Tom Moody, uh, we were asked to go and take on three teams in the beginnings of the Indian Premier League. So I was assigned Kolkata Knight Riders. And uh, total new experience. This is T20 cricket. First time really T20 cricket had um, uh, certainly been commercialised and, and commercialised in a way that was extravagant uh, because it was bringing the best cricketers in the world into one place um, with huge money and driven in a sense, uh, certainly promoted by Bollywood. Bollywood stars own uh, half of the, the franchises and Kolkata Knight Riders was owned by Mr Bollywood, a bloke by the name of Sharuk Khan. And, uh, and so uh, in meeting with uh, Sharuk, and it was quite hard, you'd meet Sharuk generally around about, I don't know, 11 o'clock at night. Um, because he'd, he'd, he's a movie star, so he'd either be doing his acting through the day or, or sleeping mainly through the day, and then he'd come alive at night, quite nocturnal. Um, and so we'd, we'd sort of sit around and talk about this Night Riders. What is this thing going to be? And in his mind, it was going to be uh, the Manchester United of, of world cricket. And as you can imagine, that really appealed uh, to my sense. I mean, that was something, a fantastic picture to aim for. Therefore, how do we go ahead and build that? That was the job. So going through that first season of IPL, which was 2008, uh, we had a chap by the name of Surav Ganguly, who was our captain. He was also nicknamed the Maharaj of Bengal um, because he was um, certainly an icon of Indian cricket, um, but also um, from the, if you like, the right side of, of Indian, um, not necessarily the caste system, but certainly Indian wealth. Um, Come the end of that particular uh, first season, it became very obvious to me that, that Surav, and one or two other, Ricky Ponting included, uh, the game had actually passed them by. Um, four years earlier, they might have been very successful, but now the game had passed them by. They, they, were, they didn't have necessarily the skill sets to adapt to this uh, different form of, of cricket. And uh, Surav not only didn't have the technical skill sets, he didn't have the physical skill sets or really the leadership skill sets that were required. So at the end of the first season, I took uh, Surav aside and said, Surav, um, uh, it's been you know, an interesting first year, but if we're actually going to uh, drive towards what um, uh, Sharuk Khan had talked about, I don't really believe that you can lead the side. I don't, I don't think you've got all the things it will take to help nurture this group that we've got and give them direction and the way that we want to play. And of course, as you can imagine, an icon of Indian cricket, hearing that he's not good enough, accepted that immediately. Um, so we had plenty of uh, toing and froing, plenty of uh, confrontation between he, me and the owners. And, uh, and the owners, um, if Surav wasn't in the room, said, we, we totally support you, uh, coach. We're right there with you, give you everything you need. As soon as Surav walks into the room, Surav, not sure what the coach is on about, but we're talking to him, and uh, I reckon we'll get him round. Um, so this continued into 2009. Halfway through 2009, basically, we were in all sorts of bother at that stage in terms of winning games. So the easiest thing to do was for the owners to say, well, it's time for the coach to be moved on and we'll leave um, Surav in charge. Um, Knight Riders took a couple of years before they became successful and Surav had, had, had moved on by that stage. Again, uh, um, something to, to dwell on when I, uh, I come back to that very shortly. Uh, these couple of last examples are just around various companies that I uh, work with. This was a um, government department, a Queensland government department. And one of, the, one of the reasons why I was called in here was that the uh, director general there, or deputy director general, uh, was using a, a, um, a tool called, uh, uh, or a human synergistics tool 
called leadership impact. So in other words, leadership impact was really a 360 degree feedback tool and what it would show would be um, whether you're a, a blue person, meaning um, collaborative, cooperative, supportive team person, whether you're a red person, meaning you'd rather go it on your own, uh, a bit resistant, uh, happy to deal in silos, or a green person, uh, basically meaning um, that you were neither one nor the other. You generally sit on the fence, uh, didn't really like being placed in a position to make decisions. So this was sort of the 360 then was a bit of an, uh, you would uh, complete the survey yourself, give you a certain um, 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 shading of colours in the various segments, and then of course your 360 would also paint the picture and you'd see what the differences were. Uh, so he was really driving for this blue culture. He wanted a, a culture of real cooperation, real teamwork and so on, that's why I was called in. And, and um, it began to actually make some difference within this, this organisation. Um, the reason why it stopped, the government changed. Uh, we moved from a, from a Labor government into, um, into a Liberal government then and basically they got rid of him and they got rid of uh, all the consultants around the place as well. But uh, the point there was that it was re really um, driven by that leader and, uh, and then supported by the leadership team and the sort of systems that he put in place. Um, the next one was a mining company, um, they, a Brazilian mining company, and they bought out um, a number of mines in Australia. And we were working in a, in a mine, um, you know, again around coaching and leadership in uh, the Hunter Valley. And uh, when we first got there, they talked about um, how proud they were as a mining group to go down to the local pub and show off the badge on their shirt. That's what they, and, and that particular mine was called Integra. And so they're very happy to wear their shirt wherever. By the time that we got there and were involved in running this coaching and leadership program, taken over by this Brazilian company, and they were called Vale, they'd lost that uh, desire to actually show off the badge. Uh, there was not necessarily a good word for this new uh, culture or this new way of, of doing and being uh, with this mining group. Uh, now, uh, New Zealand cricket, I don't think I'll, I'll dwell on. I had a couple of uh, links up there, but we can't bring them up. So, But I, I would encourage you, uh, if you ever you do get an opportunity, um, to not necessarily the bottom one, but... Uh, Anybody follow uh, NFL in the room? This gentleman down here. Um, this uh, particular uh, franchise, Seattle Seahawks, uh, there's a uh, head coach by the name of Pete Carroll that uh, came in there in uh, 2010. And uh, since he's uh, been involved, basically they've been in the playoffs um, virtually every year since, not necessarily moving through to get to Super Bowl, although they got to Super Bowl in um, 2013 and won. And then in 2014, there was the classic uh, last play um, where the, basically the coach, or well, they had a, a plan and the quarterback went with a different plan and the play missed. So they, they lost the Super Bowl on that last play. Um, so this particular um, link is an interview, it's about mastering uh, mindfulness and so on, uh, by Pete Carroll and a chap by the name of uh, Michael Gervais. I'd, I'd really encourage you, if you can maybe write that down, or I think the presentation's being kept anyway, so the, the link will be there. It's a really, really interesting insight into his thinking as a coach, uh, what they were doing in the club, and you'll hear him in that talk about grit, Grit. So if I went back to the northbound locomotive, it's the same sort of thing. This particular club uh, had developed this thing called grit and a passion for grit. And it wasn't just the players and it wasn't just the coach, but it, again, it was the whole, whole club. And then he also, in this interview, talks about drafting. So drafting was a notion, again, a bit the same, that once you became part of this club, you were caught up in this draft. You were caught up in this way that they were... That their way of being within the club. It's a really interesting interview. So, um, to the last part. 
can I ask from you guys at this stage, um, given some of those sort of stories, uh, case studies, jumping all around the place a little bit, what were some of the things that you might take away uh, that you thought would be important to this kind of concept of culture? Anybody want to hazard a, a guess or a, a thought at this moment in time? Yes, sir. Yes, everyone in a sense becomes a leader. If you're going to drive uh, culture, uh, whatever that culture might be, the more people that you can actually have driving that, the more powerful it becomes. And so a lot of people you'll hear talk about, um, you know, the, the, the standard that you will walk past is the standard that you accept. And that's for all of us. It's not just the leader, but everybody uh, within that, that group, that club, that organisation, that team must take responsibility uh, for those sort of standards and the cultures, etc., that you want to uh, continue. Yes, good. Anybody else wish to make a point, a thought? Yes, sir. Yes, I, um, certainly in a, in, a, um, in a team sport, and you, in a sense, come from individual sport, I think team sport is still very much about the individual. Uh, because without the actual individual playing at their best, it makes it very difficult then to put the whole team together. However, what becomes far more important is that team. The, there is that notion of the sacrificial acts. But also, uh, very important if you're actually bringing this group together and you're trying to um, develop, reinforce, change culture, then you've got to have a picture on where you're going. There's got to be that why in behind there. So why are we doing this? Well, this is where we're going. And if that's where we're going, we need to make some changes around here. Yeah, good. Anybody? Sorry? Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly, yeah. So leadership coaching is simply, uh, and you guys know that just as well as anybody else, it's just about those relationships. Um, that's what it is. Um, if, if you've, and whether or not um, your relationship with an individual, say uh, me with Warney and, and, uh, and uh, encouraging him to uh, lose weight at different stages meant that our relationship was probably not all that close at different stages. The important thing is that there's still a relationship there, you know, and so what as a coach you need to do then is if the relationship is not close, in other words, you, you don't feel like you can connect or, or that person's not going to listen to what you have to say, but there is a relationship there. So how do you find a way into that relationship so that the person can benefit or can actually develop? And that may be through other people, through peers, uh, and so on, through family, etc. But the relationship is, is essential. Uh, you as a leader or coach, to drive anything, need that relationship. Yeah. Anything else? <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and, and again, as we said, culture is one of those sort of intangible um, uh, pieces of a puzzle that brings a, a group of people together to achieve something or not. Um, but what becomes pretty important is that if you are going in a certain direction and you're at a certain starting point, you need to be able to measure, track, find whether you're going in the right direction. And so the, the notion of culture, well, it becomes really important then as to how you do that. Can you actually measure that? A lot of times maybe you can't, but you can certainly observe, you can certainly listen, and you can certainly uh, pull together a whole lot of uh, anecdotes, if you like, uh, but, but certainly tracking that you're on, on uh, the right direction, very important. Um, Anything else before I just put uh, my final thoughts up there because I know afternoon tea is not far off and everybody must be fanging at this stage, I imagine. Yes. On board the locomotive. Yeah, so um, it's one thing to say it. You know, it's one thing to say, yes, we're going on this journey or we're going to Everest or we're going to have a label and so on. But culture is 24 hours, seven days a week. Uh, because you might, you might actually feel like you've got it one day um, or one week or one series 
or for you one meet maybe or one training session. Um, but it can easily be just flipped on its head the next day just by your actions, your behaviours, your words or somebody else's. So it's, it's a constant job of understanding where you're going and then driving this thing by this thing called culture. And not just you, but as we said, everybody has a role in that. But it's a constant job. It doesn't stop. All right, let me just throw up uh, uh, some of those thoughts that you've just uh, expressed. So, firstly, have some sort of strategy around this. You know, what's your game plan going to be? What is your game plan going to be? So we've talked about there's a picture and there's, you know, you, you live in possibilities, you dream. Uh, so there's the dream. So we've created this dream, we all want to be part of that. And so then it's about actually, well, part of that is we, we need to get people to believe in that, of course. And, and going back to the Queensland um, example, one of the things that would occur with Queensland was that the ghosts of the past would always haunt the dressing rooms. Um, so that when things were going well, everybody was, uh, you know, on top of the world. That's great. Going back to that original quote, and you've been there yourselves, when things are not going well, well, what's actually really going on? What are you going to do about it? And so when Queensland teams were losing, it would always be, you know, well, here they go again, um, you know, post-Christmas blues. So for, for me, in trying to deal with that, was one, always reinforcing... Um, Things that we were doing well, always trying to come back to the, the half full rather than the half empty. Um, making sure that we, we were dealing in process. So coming back to the measurement point, yes, no way can we get away from results. Results are always going to be there in any sporting uh, contest. You win or you lose, that's all it's about. Uh, that's all sport's about, win or loss. Nothing else, win or loss. Um, so the results will be there. But what becomes really critical to deal with belief is, well, how do we get there? What is it that we need to actually do to win? Or if we have lost, well, what have we overlooked, maybe? Or what are the things that we've actually done right, but what have we shortcut? And can we actually address those? So trying to create that belief and build on that belief all the time. Culture becomes part of that strategy. Everything that you do, everything that you do, your actions and behaviours, the selections that you make. If you're in charge of people who come into your, your squad or come into your club, then they have to fit. They have to fit, irrespective of whether their skill levels are incredibly high. Admittedly, uh, in my role as a career coach, I didn't necessarily get to choose who came in. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we'd still have the, the very, very, very good players. And you're making a cost-benefit analysis all the time. Is the cost of having them in the group uh, outweighing or uh, not as um, uh, significant as the benefit of having them in the side uh, or in the group? So always making up those minds. We talked about everybody leading. And then, of course, uh, if you heard, you've got to play the politics. And that's where it comes back to your own coaching philosophy and principles and so on. For me, I found it always very difficult to play the politics, hence leaving Middlesex, hence leaving Kolkata Knight Riders. So I stood on principle rather than saving my job. Um, but where the politics need to be played for the benefit of necessarily a squad or a club or an organisation or indeed yourself in terms of stage of life you're at, you've got to find a way to deal with that. May not be you, but you've got to find somebody who can play that for you. So the second thing is then we've talked leadership. So leadership then really is just about what you do, day in, day out. Just your actions and behaviours. If you want a certain culture, you want a certain way that things have to be done around here, you've got to demonstrate that every moment of every day. Otherwise, why should anybody else do what you ask them to do. Why should they uh, deliver on your particular values or your vision or the way that you uh, want to um, train? Because you might think it's important, but obviously you think it's important sometimes, but not all the time. 
So as a coach and a leader, it's so important that you're doing it and it's visible, it's tangible, it's happening every day. And then again, as I said, really hit hard on the things that you want to see. You know, so if you're seeing various things going on that um, reinforce that culture you want, those values uh, being delivered on a daily basis, then find a way to, to, to reward that as immediate as you possibly can. Within that Australian team, um, we had an American uh, baseball coach and uh, he relayed a story about uh, a, a baseball team, uh, no, it was an NFL team, I think, back in the 50s. Um, Cleveland Browns, I think it was. And uh, they, through this particular season or over a period of time, developed a notion of stars. So the, the team would come off the field and... Um, basically around the dressing room, accord certain individuals with a star because of either performance or something that happened either through the game or something that they did, um, you know, in lead up to the game. And so they got a star and they put it on their helmet. And so eventually all these uh, uh, Cleveland Browns, I think they are, Cleveland Indians, whatever, uh, would run out in the field with stars on their helmets. And uh, we put this to Cricket Australia. We said, you know, players have got helmets, they're wearing them out on the ground. What if we adopt something else? And of course we couldn't do that because that would be not necessarily desecrating, but you weren't allowed to actually tamper with the helmet. So we then created our own system within the dressing room of awarding on performance, but two awards were given by the coaches around behaviours and actions that we thought were really important that were driving the values of the team. Now these little stickers were just went down to the news agent and grabbed some stickers off the, you know, those little shells. But in the end, the players really um, enjoyed getting them and stuck them on their bags wherever they could just as a reminder of this notion of um, what they'd given to the team. All right, and the last one uh, that we already talked about was tracking your pro progress. You've got to measure it along the way. As we said, results are going to be important. But if you're beginning to put in place a bit of a change, if you're beginning to put in place some new, um, uh, a new culture, a new way of doing things, a new way of being, then there's a starting point for that and a continuing point and hopefully that's part of you climbing your own Everest or your own picture. So you should be able to see some sort of correlation against existing results. Then look at those processes, e.g. could be sacrificial acts, uh, as an example of, of Carlton, what they did to go and show about how the team was so supportive, so uh, cooperative uh, in terms of actually getting a, a result. And then, as we said, part of your role as, as a coach is to listen, um, you know, extremely uh, closely and look at uh, all the various anecdotes that you can bring to play in team meetings or at different stages when, when required. Um, so, look, um, I know we're just about into um, morning and afternoon, oh, sorry, afternoon tea. Um, but that's, a, I guess, a very quick um, synopsis of some of the things that, that I experienced uh, as a coach some of the things that uh, we did, or I did, successfully and unsuccessfully, and hopefully there's a few insights um, into what this notion of, um, of culture and making some sort of cultural change might be. I th have we got time for any questions, Craig? Depends on, on you guys, the food's out there. So over to you, if you want um, to ask anything, happy to uh, try to answer. Everybody's desperate for food and coffee. Uh, playing politics, um, what's one thing you might have done differently 20 years ago than you did now? What, what, what have you learned from that? Um, look, the biggest thing I've always learned is that you've got to be true to yourself, right? So that's why I say, um, for me, um, a watershed moment was that time when I had to go and tell people how I was going to coach. And I haven't changed that philosophy, the values of the principles since then. Um, and so in terms of playing the politics, uh, I understand that they have to be done. Um, I'm probably uh, more inclined uh, to do them in a, in a subtle way these days if I have to, although I'm not in that position that I necessarily need to do it as I needed to do it then. Uh, but nonetheless, if I was playing politics, I would still be very honest, uh, very upfront with uh, what I thought should happen, why it should happen, um, 
and, and hopefully here are the outcomes. Um, but nonetheless, if, you, if you're going to play in that game, um, you've got to be reasonably skilled uh, because every organisation, every club, every sport, every business has its own politics. And uh, once you enter that world, as we're currently seeing the play out between Coates and, and Wiley, uh, and Coates has obviously been playing it for a long period of time and played it exceptionally well, and I'm not here to say whether he should go or he shouldn't go, or Wiley is right or Wiley, Wiley's wrong. Uh, but they've played the politics exceptionally well and there's not many people who can do that exceptionally well. So if you choose that that's what you need to do, then be very, very uh, sure of your steps. And you said you get someone to help you out? What would you look for in that? Um, well, again, for me, the way, the way it's helped out is that you do your job the best you possibly can. And the people who helped me out in the end were the players. So the board members, uh, who would uh, always end up, you know, as you know, a lot of board members, probably a few of us in the room here, love to smell the liniment, you know, get in there amongst the players. Um, they'd be in there and just talking around and, and trying to hear and feel things. In fact, I was at the Broncos game last night and we were watching uh, the Penrith um, box just over here and at the end of the game, we almost saw uh, three funeral directors just standing in front of the box and they were obviously the board members uh, as they were starting to talk to a few different people about, I'm sure, what was a terrible Panthers performance and maybe they're talking about Anthony Griffin or whatever. But the knives are always there. You know, the knives are always there. So all you can do is do the job, your best job possible. If you try to please a board member, try to please a player, try to please another stakeholder, in the end you please nobody and you place yourself in a really vulnerable position. So all you can do is do the job the best you can possibly do. If you're doing a really good job, hopefully when those people circle around and start talking to others, the message conveyed back is, yeah, he or she is doing a bloody good job. Even though we might be getting results, we can see what they're doing. To me, that's all you can do, unless you want to jump around the other way and play the politics. And as I say, that to me is an exceptionally dangerous job, a role. Okay, we'd better wrap it up there. Um, thank, I'd like to thank John. If you could thank John with a big round of applause. Okay.